Welcome back to the Sand series. This video directly follows from what we did last time, so if you missed that video, it's in the top corner now. In this video, we'll first split the world into chunks, and then look at some ways to speed it up. Before we'd start, I'd like to welcome all the new people who have recently subscribed. We're almost at a thousand subscribers, which is a crazy first milestone. I remember making a 15 sub special for another channel I had back in the day, so I really appreciate it and I hope you stick around. Thanks for your support. Like always, there's a written version in the description with all the code and built-in demos at http colon slash slash winter dot dev. With that out of the way, let's dive into making a performant open world sand engine. The main feature that chunks allow for is expanding the world quickly. Let's look at the two extreme solutions and then why chunks are the obvious way to go. If we store the world in a single list, whenever the player reaches the edge, the whole list needs to be reallocated. This would be fine for smaller worlds, but with bigger worlds becomes impractical. Another approach would be to store each cell in a map. This would allow for expanding worlds, but is crippled by very slow iteration caused by the memory being scattered all over the place. The solution comes from mixing the two together. If we store small lists in a map, we can have fast iteration while also being able to expand the world without copying anything. These lists will act as our chunks. And if each one is a fixed size, some simple math can find the corresponding one from a world coordinate. This only takes minimal work to implement. Each chunk is just like a small world. All we need to account for is that a particle could move from one chunk to another. We ended last time with a sand world class that contains some simple functions for getting, setting, and moving cells. Let's copy those, along with the member variables, to a new class called sandchunk. There are only a few changes we need to make. First, we'll add member variables for the chunk's world position and edit get index and inbounds to account for these. We'll also need to change the functions that take x and y from unsigned to signed ints, as world coordinates can contain negative numbers. Originally, I had tried to convert from world coordinates to chunk coordinates in the world, but that was a headache. This way, there's only one coordinate system all the way down. The second edit we'll make allows for particles to move from one chunk to another. Let's edit the changes list to store tuples and add a sand chunk pointer along with the indices from before. In commit cells, any dot first or second needs to be changed to a standard get. Where we set the cell data, instead of writing directly to the array, we'll use get cell and set cell with the source chunk. Now that we have chunks that can work together, we need to coordinate them in the sans world. Let's replace every function from before with one that gets a chunk and then calls its respected function. The final piece we need to add is storage for the chunks. I opted for a vector of sand chunk pointers for iteration and a map to look them up by coordinate. Now that we have our containers, we can make get chunk. First we'll convert the world coordinates into a chunk location, and then we'll get the chunk or create a new one. To create a new chunk, let's make a function called create chunk and pass it the location. Here we can define the world boundaries. If the location is inside, we'll make a new chunk, add it to the containers, and return. Finally, the update function needs to be edited to iterate over the chunks. And with that we have chunked the world. I've made the texture draw a red pixel on the boundary of each chunk so we can see them. While I'm at it, I've made the camera center around the player, so now we can fly around and see all the chunks around us. Optimization is something that never ends, so I'm only going to look at a few of the most bang for buck areas we can smooth out. Let's start with something small. Currently, every time a world function gets called, it needs to find a chunk from the map. These can't expect it to be in the cache, so hitting this map for every cell will add up to a considerable loss of time. To get around this, let's make a sand worker class that stores a chunk from the map, then only calls back to the world if necessary. This also gives us a nice way to hook into the engine with other custom behaviors. Now we can override this class and put our custom cell behaviors in it. To make use of this, let's edit the update function. You could add a list of these in the worlds, but for now I'll just hard code this one. The biggest time sink is iterating over the cells. So anything we can do to cut down on the number we need to check will improve the frame rate dramatically. The most obvious is that most chunks are completely empty, so we could delete those and remove them from iteration entirely. To do this, let's add a count of filled cells in the sand chunk. When setting a cell, if the source is filled but the destination isn't, we'll increment by one. Inversely, if the destination is filled and we're setting it to empty, we'll decrement. In the sands world, let's add a new function called remove empty chunks, then call it before the world update. If we look back at the chunk visualization, there are now only chunks where there are field cells. However, we still iterate over the static cells like rocks. This brings us to the second optimization. If a chunk only has a single field cell, every cell is still iterated. We could, though, select only a subsection to iterate. This technique is commonly referred to as a dirty rectangle and used in UI painting to save time by not redrawing static elements. To implement this, let's add a min, max, x, and y to the sand chunk along with two functions named updateRec and keepAlive. 
Whenever a cell gets set or moved, this rectangle needs to expand to contain it for the next update. We can't expand this rectangle during an update, so we need to double buffer it like we did for the initial processing version of the cells array. Then in set cell, we'll pass the index to keep alive. Because the chunks can update each other's rectangles, we need to wait for all the chunks to be committed before calling update rec. To do this, let's add another loop after committing the cells in the main update. Now in the sand workers update function, instead of iterating from zero to the boundary, we can iterate from the min to the max of the rectangle. I was under the impression that this is all that was required, but if we look at the boundary of a sleeping chunk, the cells don't wake up correctly. This happens because the rectangles are bounded by the chunks and they can't talk to their neighbors. We need a way to notify the chunk that an update has happened on their border. Let's add a keep alive function to the world. And for now, let's just edit move cell in the sand worker to use it. Now finally, let's look at what we got. That's a considerable speed up. This made it sound easy, but in reality, it took me a while to stamp out all the bugs. If you're following along, before we get into threading, make sure this works 100% because it's going to be impossible to debug without disabling the threading part first. These optimizations won't have much effect if the whole screen is full of moving cells, though. We need to look to threading to alleviate that. Currently, we update each chunk one by one, but chunks are mostly independent from one another. This makes them perfect candidates for thread pooling. The idea of a thread pool is to queue up a series of tasks and execute as many at a time as there are threads in the pool. In my engine, I've got a thread pool variable named task. You can check out the code for that in the description. Let's edit the update function to use this thread pool. And we're done. Let's see a demo. Well, if only it was that simple, right? There are many issues with this code. If you look at the execution line by line, notice that the current thread only pushes tasks onto the queue, leaving the chunk updates to finish sometime in the future. Before that can happen, we start calling commit cells. This causes race conditions all over the place and an inevitable crash. To fix this, we need a way to wait for all the chunks to finish. C++ provides the standard conditional variable class, which we can use to pause a thread until a condition is met, and the standard mutex class, which allows us to mark critical sections for the OS to guard. Only one thread can run critical sections protected by a specific mutex at a time, which allows us to safely edit shared variables in different threads. To make these changes, we'll need three variables. One conditional variable, one mutex, and a count of chunks to update. After updating the chunk, we'll lock and decrement the count. We'll use a standard unique lock and pass it the mutex. This locks the mutex until it pops off the stack, so we can use a scope and make it a one-liner. Now that we have the correct count, we can tie it all together with a conditional variable. These act like messengers between threads. We can send notifications to a waiting thread by calling notify1. Calling wait blocks the thread until it receives a notification. Once it does and the condition is met, it continues onwards with the mutex locked. We can also multi-thread the commit cell function in much the same way. Before we do that, to keep the code clean, I'm going to throw this loop into a lambda called do for all chunks. Then we can make two calls to it, one for the updating and the other for the commitment. Let's see what happens when we run it now. It seems stable, but eventually it crashes. Why could this be? Well, we didn't account for the different threads calling back into the world and into other chunks. Those other chunks could be getting updated at the same time, creating more race conditions. We need to consider who could be calling what functions in the sand chunk and sands worlds, and make sure to guard the ones that multiple threads could call at the same time. Let's start with the functions in the sand chunk. Multiple threads could collide in set cell, move cell, and keep alive. So we'll need three mutexes. In set cell, we only need to guard the filled cell count because no two cells in the array will get written or read at the same time. This is guaranteed by the way that commit cells works, and we won't be drawing with the mouse during the update. In move cell, we need to lock the whole list, unfortunately. But this should only be in conflict when a chunk tries to move a particle into a neighboring chunk, which is a low percentage of the moves. Finally, we also need to lock the keep alive function. In sans worlds, we could use two mutexes to guard the list and map, but guarding the whole map every time it needs to be accessed will cripple the multi threaded performance. To get around this, we can use a concurrent map. I saw that Microsoft provides a concurrent unordered map, so I just replaced the current map with it. Basically, this locks the buckets instead of the whole container, so more threads can key into it at once. We need to lock the list though, but we never use it for access besides iteration, so we only need to lock when inserting into it as multiple threads could be creating chunks at the same time. And that should be all for multi-threading. Let's take a look at the performance. Look at that frame time. I think this is a good basis for a strong sand engine. Now I'm going to try and build a game with it, so expect a few devlogs about that. I was hoping to make a game in a month, but including engine dev time, I'm already way past that, so I'll put a pause on the clocks and do some sort of weekly thing if I can. I think that'll be interesting. I tried making that space game I was talking about, and it was actually pretty cool, but there wasn't too much sand involved, unfortunately. 
So I'm going to try and repurpose the mechanics of it into something on the ground instead of space. So we'll see how that goes. Thanks for watching. I hope to catch you next time.